Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to our new series, Masterclass on Companies Act 2013. An insight into some significant definition is a first session today we are going to. So friends, we are starting with the definition itself because what we do, generally we leave aside definitions and start from the relevant provisions. Of course, there are certain tracks, very crucial provision in the Companies Act, which we keep on reading. There may be the feeling that what is that again and again Companies Act and again and again reading the same. So I'll put that way that uh, Gita or Bible or uh, whatever, Quran or whatever is there, you keep on reading, you will get more and more new meaning. The same is the situation with our own Gita Companies Act. We are company secretaries and I will say that we are corporate law advisors and masters, but our basic remains Companies Act. And accordingly, this session require again and again. And every time we require to read, every time we get a new meaning. Here, whatever is your experience, at the age experience of say 50 years, 60 years, you still learn something new. And that's why this session. Of course, there are, so they have uh, made the career beyond Companies Act as a compliance head of different sector specific, NBFC, mutual fund, and various other industry, compliance officer, legal officer, HR officers, they all am sure. But I put that way, that Companies Act is a base, it's a core. It's the core and everything is, everything is connected to it, entire body. And to make it straight and strong, and healthy, we should be well acquainted with what is Companies Act so that the core remains strong and entire all wings of that body become dependent on it, remain, grow and prosper. So the Companies Act and friends, today uh, we have with us Ms. Deepika Thakur Chawan. To introduce Ms. Deepika Thakur Chawan, I'll say that she is a law graduate from Osmania University, Hyderabad, with three gold medals from the academy. Great. She is a qualified company secretary, CA enter, and holds membership of ICSI and has 17 years plus experience with 10 years in BFI sector. Fantastic. She has been associated with SL Group, Abex Cash, Stream Global Service Limited, time leading their compliance function. Was also associated with industry body, Internet and Mobile Association of India. Friends, this is something what all CS can contribute and it's armed payment council in their effort for creating framework document and risk management methodology for prepaid payment instrument issuers. Fantastic, Mr. Pika. Currently working as a chief compliance officer, company secretary, and high legal of Oxilo Film Service Private Limited. Oxilo is an NBFC company promoted by Anam Group with Barlampur Chini Mills Limited, ICICI Bank, Tata Capital Growth Fund as its prime investors. After joining Oxilo Finance Service Private Limited as a startup and set up a legal and compliance function of the company. Welcome, Ms. Deepika. Thanks for your time and we'll surely get benefit from your knowledge and experience. Thanks, Rotan. I'm looking forward to it. Uh, friends, we have with us Mr. Sudhakar and Mr. Bala. As you know, Mr. Bala has uh, more than four decades of experience in secretarial and other law. And he has worked with Poseco India Limited and he's a regular speaker at various forums. And I say he's the highest article writer. You may be knowing that. Welcome, Mr. Bala. Thanks a lot. We have with Mr. Us, Mr. Sudhakar Sarvatula. 
you know all all of you know them know him he is a member of ca and cs institute and also member of institute of charter secretary administration administrators uk he last worked as a president vice president corporate secretary department of reliance industries limited for 17 years welcome mr sudaka friends uh, i will now uh, request all of you to as usual to put your chat box uh, uh, you know all questions in your chat box as it is to be better administered at the end of the session we will uh, allow the people to speak who raise the hand and meanwhile, I'll request all of you to contribute to the seminar. And friends, today's session is on definition. One would wonder what is definition, but friends, definition only changed the entire meaning. So with these few words, I'll request uh, Ms. Deepika to say a few words on the topic. And uh, then Mr. Sudhaka, then Mr. Bala. And Aditi, then you can start. Yeah, friends, sorry, I forgot to introduce my partner, Aditi Patnaya. Uh, she is with us since years and uh, she is today presenting, very intelligent and to partner. Thanks, Aditi. Thanks a lot for participation. Yeah, Ms. Deepika, thanks a lot for time and over to you for a few words from you. Thank you. Sure, ma'am. Um, um, we, we've actually discussed uh, this topic as to... Uh, whether this can actually have a session of this kind. Uh, we realized when Aditi kind of briefed us uh, on the definitions and the intricacies that it had and the inputs that we received from our esteemed panelists, uh, Sudhakar sir and Bala sir, we realized in spite of having practiced, uh, worked in the field for about a decade, uh, the definition still remain to be, you know, uh, there has to be a lot of things attached to it. One has to really examine a definition as well. Uh, as Aditi takes us through, we'll uh, uh, contribution with any said a definition starts like a fundamental. I mean, in any case, in anything that we build up, it starts with fundamentals, and so are the definitions for the Companies Act. And uh, I am also looking forward to learn a lot from the uh, the the questions that might come in from uh, from the uh, the attendees here. While I've heard it from Sudhakar sir and Bala sir, and I really myself learned. And uh, I'm, I'm looking forward for a very gainful one hour uh, uh, now. So thank you. I think I'll pass it on to Sudhakar for his views. Thank you, Ms. Lipin. Yes, Mr. Sudhakar. Uh, thank you, Ms. Lipin. Good morning, everyone. Namaskaram. In fact, uh, we had a traverse of one decade with Companies Act 2013. It looks like as if the act was legislated yesterday and we started our struggles with the act, but we have already crossed it 10 years. When we look back, are we in this 10 years, we could have a reasonable hold on the Companies Act 2013? I have my own doubts about that. What is in store for us in future and what we have already faced in the past one decade? So we at Meta and Meta thought that why can't we have a masterclass on Companies Act 2013? And we have chosen 6th April 2024, like very apt date, because 1st April 2014, this act was completely came into force. So almost we have completed 10 years with that. As we all know that this act was enacted with a view to consolidate and amend the law to meet the present regulatory requirements. I'm sure that uh, many of the seniors are aware of this when Indian economy got converged with the global economy in the year 1991. It was felt that 1956 Act was not able to meet the regulatory requirements. And it was felt that this Act needs to be completely rehashed. So the efforts were started in 1993 for the first time. And after that, 1997, again, it has been taken up. But not much progress has taken place. So there was major amendments in the years 2000, 2001, and 2002 to the erstwhile Companies Act 1956. Very major amendments have come at that time. Again, 2008, the company's bill was placed in the parliament. It was referred to the standing committee, the two and four uh, that was going, the ping pong game was going on. 
So by the time we came to 2012, the bill was again placed in the parliament. So most of the professionals, professional institutes, chapters of commerce, and even the regulators themselves have also thought that whether this act will see the daylight any time. But it so happened that the somehow this act was pushed and uh, got saw the daylight on 30th August 2013. When the rules were not even ready, this act was pushed and enforced. As we all know that Companies Act 2013 is a rule-based law than unlike the Companies Act 1956. But when this act was enforced and the rules were not ready even, so what they did was about 91 sections which does not require any kind of rules were enforced. After that, the rules were made ready at 1st April 2014. This act was completely legislated. So I can say that this act was an ineptly drafted and hastily implemented act. Because of that, it has given a lot of difficulties for all of us. But one thing good with this act is this act has substantially rise in the bar of corporate governance. Several new concepts have been introduced like independent directors, women directors, gender diversity was given importance, related party transactions, private placement, the stringent norms have been introduced. And several things like that, you know, whether you can say constitution of committees, formulation of policies, all the things. But around the act when this was being legislated, as we all know that three major scams have taken place. That is Satyam, Sahara and Sharda Chitfan's case. I used to say in those days on the lighter side that Satyam, Sivam and Sundara. So if you see the kind of stringency what has been brought in the accounts and audit related provisions in chapter 9 and 10, could see that was Satyam's uh, was called as you know in that episode. Similarly, if you see the stringency what has been brought in section 42, it was courtesy Sahara case. In fact, if some of you may remember that the rules which were of uh, pertain to section 42 were so stringent that section as well as the rules were completely rehashed thereafter. And as far as the deposits or fixed deposits are concerned, let's see again, Sharda Chit Fund's case. So these three major scams have played their very role while the draftsmen were drafting the Companies Act 2013. This act was so, so stringent in those days. In fact, I used to read that the word fine appeared 189 times, penalties appeared 41 times, prosecution appeared 24 times, and imprisonment 76 times. I used to say that the, this is the most draconian act after Ferrar 1974. Because, in fact, you know, Mr. Damodaran, who was the, uh, the, the, the chairman, Sebi, he used to say that this was like, looks like a jokes book. In fact, the professional went to this extreme of recommending that this act is to be completely withdrawn because it cannot be Info, uh, implemented the way it was drafted and enforced. But of course, we all know that once an act is legislated, it cannot be withdrawn just like that. Of course, the government was also realized that what were the difficulties of the professionals as well as of the profession. And they made changes in the four amendments act, Companies Amendment Act 2015, 2017, 2019 and 2020. Rules have been diluted to a large extent and the penal provisions have been diluted substantially. One thing we must remember that the criminal provisions have not been touched at all. So we need to be very careful as far as the wherever the criminal penal provisions are there, the way they were drafted originally, they're still there intact as it is. So this act is very difficult used to be very difficult rather let me put it this way to study interpret and implement in isolation so institute has used to uh, in fact they have organized a lot many programs and i had uh, the privilege of addressing several seminars conferences on this particular subject because of that i immensely got benefited also but still i say that that the 
acts, whatever the stringency is there, it is yet to come. Why I'm saying this thing is because if you compare with the 1956 Act, the amount of filings what are required, the amount of information which needs to be disseminated to the regulator is much 10 times more than what it was in the, the Companies Act 1956. In fact, in those days, while addressing the, uh, the participants, I used to say that the amount of information what we were disseminating and ROC is collecting the data is multifold. But once the data mining takes place, we all will be facing the music of the regulator. That point of time, some of the people used to question that whether the ROC got that kind of a bandwidth to do the data mining. Now we know that MCA version 3, wherein they have used introduced a lot of artificial intelligence machine language tools, definitely they are going to do the data mining. According to me, in fact, I recently came to know that all the routine work has been shifted to Panesar and all the ROCs and RDs are going to now onwards to uh, what's called as paid their more of their time in the inspections and investigations. And the way the act was implemented, the act, the way the act was supposed to be implemented. So, friends, what I would like to say is that let us take this act seriously. This act need to be respected, and this act need to be given the amount of intensity of our study and interpretation what it requires. So, to ensure that this is around the year closing, audits are going to be started. So we thought this is the most uh, vital time for this. It started this masterclass. And in fact, my colleague Aditi is going to make the first presentation. Aditi is the head of our secretarial audits. And she always used to say that fundamentals are to be very strong. So she says, that, let me start with the definitions itself. I said, that's a good idea because normally we got a tendency of not reading the definitions at all. You ask any student, even the company secretary or the young professional who has joined the profession, they will always read the major sections, but very few of us give the importance to the uh, what's called the, the definition section. Unless until we know that the definitions, the how to interpret that thoroughly, we may not be able to implement the act the way it is supposed to be implemented. So I will give a pause here. And after that, uh, that I interview, uh, requesting Bala to take, and after that, Aditi will make the presentation. Thank you very much. Good morning to all of you. I am really overwhelmed to see the score at this point of time, which is nearing to 300. We are almost 287. This itself shows the importance of this webinar. And Mr. Sudhakar has taken us the history of the last 10 years of travels of the company site. It's actually time for us to see how far we travel, where we are standing. That is the thing. But since already people have spoken about on this, I will restrict only to today's webinar. I will not get into further detail. If we talk about the definition, if I actually go into the definition of Definition meaning as per the dictionary, it is actually saying it is nothing but it's a statement which is talking about the nature, scope of meaning of something. That is what it is talking about. Why the definition is important? Because the definition which is actually spelled out here is uh, the one which are actually used in the statues, the exact words and expressions elsewhere in the statue when you are talking about it. That is why it is very important for us to understand the definition. Because the whole idea of understanding the definition is to avoid any frequent repetition and also have a right interpretation of the specific words when used in the statute. That is what it is required. When we talk about the definition, we also need to understand the type of the definition which are actually there. Because there are type of definition which is having restrictive definitions. That means it talks about means this means what then there are extensive definition that means which talks about this includes these are the words you would have come across then somewhere you will also say restrictive on this thing that means the word means and includes that is also used so it is really really very important for us to know what are the definition which are restrictive definitions 
what are the depression which are actually expensive depressions what are the depression which are actually very important in terms of the restrictive depression because the depressions which are actually given in this act is not the same elsewhere in the other acts also because when we talk about the depression of a promoter promoter under the company act not the same with the cb act it is not the same under the takeover product it is not same under the pta act. so this is one thing is very clear so really really speaking the purpose not only that and when you are talking about the depression you will also come across what you call proviso then again you will come across what you call explanations what is the purpose of giving this explanation etc because to explain and give you the clarity what is the meaning of words contained in the particular section what is the part and parcel of enactment so all the things which are actually there so really really speaking we need to understand the definition because aditi is actually going to take us the various definition and for the first time in the act i think the officer and default has been defined in the 2013 act it was not there in the 1956 act in 1956 act if we say it is officer and default the word which was used but who are the officer and default that has been elaborately defined in this particular act there are a lot of things which has actually taken here so it is very important for all of us to know the definition very well to understand to interpret the law correctly and to do the things so i think i give a pause here so i will not take much of the time aditi will start and she will take us through the various uh, important definition at least to understand the things and i request all of the participants to put their questions on the chat box so we will take as and when one thing i would like to tell you already i have seen some questions which are relating to the future things not restricted to depression today's webinar is restricting only to the depressions any question which is relating to other things will be taken in the appropriate uh, webinar when we are taking because it is going to be a series of webinars which is going to travel around 10 to 12 webinars so appropriate time those questions will be taken today please restrict yourself putting the question relevant to this webinar only thank you over to aditi please yeah baby please take care uh good morning everyone uh we welcome you once again to the uh, master class on companies act i think a lot has already been spoken by our eminent panelists so thank you sudhakar sir bala sir and dipti madam a uh, special thanks to ms dipika once again from our side uh so uh, companies act uh, is like uh, we know it's been a decade to companies act 2013 but uh, still there are certain areas i would say which are the gray areas which uh, there are certain points which uh, differences of opinion arises so our intention is just to quickly uh, go through the uh, important definitions uh, so now starting off uh, with the first definition which is associate company uh, section 2 subsection 6 uh, uh, of companies act talks about associate company in relation to another company meaning that the other company should have a significant influence but it should not be a subsidiary company and includes a joint venture so three points to be considered here associate company cannot be a subsidiary company these are two different uh, uh, definitions which is there under the companies act and joint venture is a part of an associate company so when we are reading the definition of associate company joint venture has to be read in consonance now when we are talking about uh, significant influence significant influence here has been defined as control of at least 20 i i'll request go slow in speaking that will give us more concentration i think so because we have mix of audience youngsters experienced quite seniors so we should do a balance thanks sorry for sure ma'am okay ma'am okay uh so uh, now to understand what an associate company is so definitely first we have to see that that company has a significant influence secondly it should not be a subsidiary company now uh, deriving the definition of significant influence so supposedly there are two companies and one company is kind of exercising at least 20% of total voting power in another company or it has a control or is participating in business 
uh, decisions under that agreement, under any agreement, then that is termed as an associate company. So when we are reading Associate Company for Companies Act, joint venture is to be read along with associate company. And a joint venture basically means a joint arrangement whereby there are two parties involved and both the parties have an equal right or maybe the percentage might differ, but they have a right to the net assets of the arrangement. So supposedly two companies or two uh, corporates have come together for an arrangement and that arrangement is formed and they have a right over the net assets of that arrangement, then that becomes a joint venture. So when we are talking about the associate company, joint venture is also a part of that definition. Uh, so here is an example. So one thing we have to keep in mind here is associate company is distinct from that of a subsidiary company. Subsidiary company has been kind of dealt with at the later part of this session. So we will just give an example here. When we are talking about Pedalite Industries, which has around a 40.64 percentage of voting rights in Vinyl Chemicals India Limited. So Pedalite becomes the holding company and Vinyl Chemicals becomes the associate company because the controlling power here is more than 20 percent, that is 40.64 percent. A few other matters uh, in relation to associate companies. So when we are reading, because uh, why this definition is very important, as Balasar has also put it, when we are looking at a definition, it should not be only read as a definition, but it has to be linked up with separate uh, several other provisions in the Act. So associate company is also considered as a related party as per section 2, subsection 76, 8 of the Companies Act. So related party here means a holding company, a, subs a subsidiary company or an associate company. So any transaction that a company is entering into with any of these companies, it is treated as a related party transaction. And when we talk about related party, section 188 comes into being. So when we are entering into transactions with related parties, uh, which is a holding a subsidiary or an associate company, we will have to abide by the provisions which has been defined under section 188. Uh, one of the other important uh, part here is, so before any related party is appointed to any office or place of profit, even in an associate company, then the company would be required to obtain the approval of the board. Because as we said, associate company is a related party. So when we are placing anybody in the office of profit of an associate company, then requisite approvals have to be taken. Uh, now we come to a very important part that is uh, consolidation of accounts. So when we talk about uh, an associate company then inclusive... Relevant which okay, associate company is on. Sorry. Okay. Uh, so uh, it is like now when we talk about associate company inclusive of joint venture or a subsidiary, we will have to understand that this needs to be consolidated. The accounts needs to be consolidated. So it is as per section 129, subsection 3 of the Companies Act, which says that if any company, if any holding company is having a subsidiary or an associate, they have to prepare uh, consolidated financial statements uh, in the same form and manner as they are preparing their financial statements. And most importantly, these consolidated financial statements also have to be placed before the shareholders along with the standalone financial statements for their approval or for their adoption. So uh, basically, uh, here. Uh, one contentious issue here we can discuss is, uh, will the answer remain the same if a limited liability partnership becomes an associate or a joint venture? Uh, so a lot has been spoken whether they can be an associate. So we will uh, go back, we will refer to a certain FAQs which was uh, published by the Institute of Chartered Accountants of India. So here it has been said that 
even if a llp is an associate or a joint venture we uh, the holding company has to abide by schedule 3 uh, which talks about the manner of preparation of financial statements so when we are uh, referring to schedule 3 there there is again a reference drawn to accounting standards so for this particular matter accounting standards uh, uh, 21 and 110 is getting attracted whereby it has been very clearly mentioned that if some entity is exercising a control over another entity so the word used in the accounting standards is entity not specific to company and uh, therefore so any entity which is exercising a control over the other so the controlling entity is bound to uh, consolidate its accounts with with the organizations or with the entities over which they are exercising the control so even if a limited liability partnership is an associate or a joint venture the holding company needs to consolidate its accounts and place it before the uh, annual general meeting and aditi, the reason aditi there is one question has been asked could you highlight what is the fellow subsidiary visavi associate company that is one thing and second thing what is the logic of excluding section 8 company from the category of small company section 285 proviso 8 Mr. Bala, salute yeah. take question. Let her finish associate company relevant thing and then the question. Otherwise, okay, you... okay, yeah? no problem. Uh, okay uh, so so consolidation of financial statements so the intent of law behind this is just that they are because uh, since you are having a majority of shareholding in another entity so we kind of get a very clear view of the uh, dealings that is undertaken and there is no misappropriation of funds so that is the reason why uh, consolidation has been mandated uh, so now vacation of office of director so uh, this is one more point in case of an associate company if somebody is holding a position as a employee or as a position in the associate company and by virtue of that he continues to hold a position in the uh, holding company the moment that person ceases to enjoy the position in the associate he also loses the position subsequently in the holding company so this is the link that is being created between a holding and a subsidiary and a associate company uh so sir yes we can take the questions now yeah because somebody wants to know actually could you explain the associate company and the fellow subsidiary the question actually reads here could you highlight on fellow subsidiary visavi associate company so so subsidiaries i mean uh, we will be covering uh, subsidiaries at the uh, later part so probably we can take this up at that point okay sure no problem then the next one they are talking about the what is the logic of yeah, this also relevant to the next only because small company they are talking but they are referring section 285 proviso 8 what could be the logic of excluding section 8 company from the category of small company uh yes sir. so so we have covered a uh, small company so probably we can again Achha, it is coming in the future okay, yes sir okay. yes sir okay then there is something called the section 2013 right does not def define sister concern however can we say sister concern is also the informal term of the associate company miss dipika sudhakar you would like to comment the sister concern is a very loosely worded uh, term it is not it is nothing to do with the companies act as such because it may so happen there may be companies which are not associates which are not having subsidiary or holding relationship but still they belong to the same group so sometimes we may say they are sister concerns or suppose you know some people say subsidiaries are sister concerns some people say joint venture companies are sister concerns like that but let us uh, not link the word uh, the loosely used word sister concern with the companies act as such So it is not defined, but it is generally used in the general panel. Yeah, it, that it. is right. That is right. And uh, someone has asked whether private limited company has also to require to prepare consolidated statement. That is the question. Yeah, wherever okay. accounting standards are applicable, right. they have to. Yeah, consolidate. accounting standards yeah, are applicable. No, they have to prepare. Right. I did not answer, but yeah. Yeah. And somebody is telling, can you please elaborate on the slide being displayed on the screen, the recent vacation? okay 
so uh, vacation of office of director so it's like uh, here what is happening is we are establishing the relationship between a holding company and an associate company so if by virtue of holding position in an associate company because sometimes what happens is the associate there are requirements if not under the companies act there are certain other requirements wherein you need to have similar kind of positions in both the uh, entities so by virtue of somebody holding a position either is a as a director or any other employment in the associate company if they are not if they cease to hold that position in the associate company subsequently they also cease to hold the position in the holding company so it is like i'll just put it in this way for government companies like how it happens is when the government nominates someone uh, by virtue of a position so if that position is vacated that position of a director is also vacated <coughs> sorry But there is one more thing as an input can the control of participating in the business decision under an agreement be exercising significant influence emphasizing on business decision be explained by way of any example so it is basically control of participating in business decision under an agreement is mentioned no so they yeah. are uh, they are giving the emphasis on business decision so can you give example of explaining how the control on business decision can be explained the control on the business decision sometimes what happens is uh, the, between the parties there is an understanding that affirmative vote is required whenever the unless until the affirmative vote is there from all the parties the business decision cannot be finalized even if one party says that they vote uh, not in affirmation then you cannot take up the decision that is how they are controlling the business decisions can we put it like that yeah and uh, ms dipika anything you would like to add no uh, just uh, okay. like uh, sir mentioned yeah as sudhakar i hope i am audible yeah as sudhakar sir mentioned typically uh, you know the control is related with the fact that the when when an investor or an entity joins you and there is a shareholders agreement for example or a subscription agreement wherein you are according certain rights to them in the form of having a board uh, number of directors appointed on the board or uh, you know the policy decisions to be taken or the approvals on the policy affirmative right is what the key word here they have that kind of a decision making power and that's how the control is exercised so just to uh, just to add it just to add it further rightly Yeah, yeah Deepika, go ahead. Please, sorry, go ahead, go ahead. No, that's it, sir. I, I think that that's what I was just uh, placing the emphasis on. That the definition do simply doesn't talk about the twenty percent uh, significant influence or the investment in it, but about the control decision. So, which is you know sometimes becomes tricky for us to interpret and uh, apply practically. So, yeah, over to you, yeah, sir. I think you can elaborate. See, sometimes it may so happen. You know, when I am talking about the affirmative decisions. there may be an understanding between the parties which may be by way of an agreement wherein they say that if any capital expenditure say beyond x amount of crores the affirmative vote of the parties is required similarly whenever you are making any borrowing whenever you are making any investments whenever you are going for any expansion plans diversification plans acquisitions for all these things you need the affirmative vote so that means what these are all the business decisions only be controlled by the major parties that this affirmative vote decision normally is always given to the big brother whoever it is that making the major investment in the company or in case of a joint venture agreements also it may so happen that is what it is called as controlling the business decisions yeah there is another question is there associate companies or foreign companies are covered as the definition companies do not cover the foreign companies the body corporates are covered both in subsidiary companies and holding companies okay and associate companies i need to see the definition whether it is a company is covered or body corporate is covered if body corporate is covered then definitely even foreign companies are also covered in that uh so going ahead uh, now the next uh, important uh, definition is a body corporate or corporation uh, section 2 subsection 11 of companies act 
so a body corporate corporation includes a company which is incorporated outside india but does not include a cooperative uh, society which is registered under the law relating to cooperative society or any other body corporate not being a company which the central government may by notification specify in this behalf so previously even a incorporation soul which was uh, occupied by a single person was there as an exclusion in 1956 but uh, 2013 is more clear that it is a company and including one which is incorporated outside india so again here a point of uh, contention comes is whether llp because everywhere llp has been given the status of a company as well as a partnership firm so when we are talking of a llp will llp be defined as a body corporate because uh, specifically uh, llp has uh, as a body corporate it has not been defined under the companies act but when we read the limited liability partnership act 2008 there it has been mentioned that llp is a body corporate so if we read according to that act then llp can be considered as a body corporate even though no specific mention of it has been given in the companies act uh now coming to the definition of a company so section 2 subsection 20 of the companies act defines company means uh, any company there which is a question is a trust a body corporate trust is not a body corporate yeah okay yeah trust is not a body corporate definitely so coming to definition of a company a uh, company means a company which is incorporated under this act or under any previous company law and it is an artificial person created by law having separate legal entity and perpetual succession so company uh, we we are aware of the fact that the company is separate from the persons who are controlling it or uh, the board of directors or the shareholders uh, hence if an artificial person is having a separate legal entity and it is having a perpetual succession which means that it goes on for forever irrespective of shareholders or directors undergoing a change then it qualifies to be a company and companies which have been incorporated in any previous laws also they also qualify to be known as companies under the current act uh now coming to the definition of control uh so the term control has been uh, defined differently under uh, different acts that we have in place so the companies act looks at it in one uh, way the uh, sebi sas regulation also has a definition the insolvency bankruptcy code also has a definition for it competition law also has a definition for it so if we focus uh, on what the companies act is talking about so control here is it includes uh, the right to appoint majority of directors or control the management or policy decisions so three uh, three points if if somebody is exercising either of the three points then they qualify to have a control over the other entity so another important point here is it can be either directly or indirectly which is exercisable either by one person or persons acting individually or in concert and when we are talking about how these uh, rights are derived so the right to appoint or control the management or policy decisions it either can be the simplest way of having that right would be by way of shareholding if someone is having a majority of shares then definitely the majority of directors can be appointed and the rights follow or it can be by way of management rights given or arrangement uh, certain arrangements or agreements entered into with that person it can be a shareholder agreement or voting arrangement or in any other manner so uh, basically by shareholding they they tend to exercise that right over the other entity but it can also be by way of an agreement that that certain person has been given a right to control the other entity uh now to a uh, given example of an indirect and a direct uh, uh, control so for example a is a holding company of c limited and a wants to exercise a control with z limited so now a and z are not related in any way but it is through c that a and z can be related so when 
uh, we are talking about an in about a direct control here. A direct control might be by virtue of the shareholding which A has in the C Limited. So that is how they can kind of uh, control the policy uh, making or can appoint the majority. Now, supposedly we have to, uh, supposedly A as a holding company wants to have an indirect control over Z Limited. So that can happen only if A will be kind of, you know, passing or acquiring shares of Z Limited through C Limited. So it is like it becomes the parent entity of Z Limited and through holding shares in C Limited, it can have a control over Z Limited. So this is how we can exercise the control over uh, one entity can exercise a control over other entity. Uh, now, uh, this is a very uh, important uh, case law when, uh, when we talk about in control. So control here does not necessarily mean that you are responsible for the activities of another entity. So control just gives you a participation right in the policy decisions or in the appointment of board of directors. So in the case of uh, Balwant Rai Saluja versus Air India, the Supreme Court uh, had held that a certain uh, Air India had a certain degree of control over its subsidiaries, but the employees who are working in the canteen were not Air India's uh, employees. So that is how there has been distinct features that is, Air India continues to have its own legal uh, existence. So does the HCI, which is a subsidiary of uh, Air India. So the court here observed that the control here is only in the nature of supervision. Nothing more than that. So control here is why? Because if Air India as an entity is providing subsidy to HCI, which is the Hotel Corporation of India, for its growth and it is uh, bearing its financial burden. So it will have a limited right, a limited right in uh, ensuring an effective utilization of resources. But as regards HCI, it, it continues to remain a separate legal entity. Uh, moving further, uh, now coming to the definition of court, uh, section uh, 2, subsection 29 talks about establishment of court. So uh, the apex court here is the high court. So high court uh, basically has the power wherein the registered office of that company is situated. So the highest authority is high court. And uh, we can appear before a high court only when the district court has not been empowered to hear those cases. So it is the district court which can be, uh, uh, which is uh, addressing to all the uh, matters. And if those, there are some specific uh, matters which is not specifically falling under the jurisdiction of the district court, that can be uh, kind of referred to the high court under uh, whose jurisdiction it falls. So uh, even when it comes to district courts, it is the central government who by notification uh, very specifically defines or gives the power to exercise uh, upon, upon which it has to kind of function. Uh, now coming to court of session and a metropolitan magistrate or a judicial magistrate of the first class. So there are certain matters uh, which can be referred to metropolitan magistrate and to a court of session before we appear to the district court or the high court. So all of these jurisdictions have been kind of notified by the central government and the offenses have been uh, specified as to who can uh, address to which matters. Uh, then there is a special court which has been established under the Companies Act section 435. Now, uh, what is the special court all about? So if we refer to section 435, uh, special court is one which is uh, established by the central government for kind of a speedy trial of offenses. So there might be situations where a lot of pending cases might be there. So as on date, if we see uh, the state of Uttar Pradesh, the state of Jharkhand, these are the places which have established special courts. And special courts, I would say they are 
the composition of a special court is a combination of a metropolitan magistrate and that of a court of session, uh, wherein a metropolitan magistrate is also a member and there can be a single uh, judge as a session judge. And uh, the special court, which is being established by the central government, it is uh, done in concurrence with the high court under whose jurisdiction these uh, uh, members who are to be a part of the special court would be working under. I think, Aditi, if I'm not mistaken, Metropolitan Magistrate Court generally throws the criminal nature of the offences, correct? Right, sir. Yeah. Uh, moving ahead, now coming to financial year. So section uh, 2, subsection 41 of Companies Act, it uh, defines a financial year uh, as a period ending on 31st day of March every year. And wherein uh, a company which has been incorporated post 1st January of a year, then the period will be the March of the following year. So uh, this is like, for example, if we take a X Limited, which has been incorporated, uh, say, on the 4th of February, 2022. So 31st March 22 will not be considered as its first financial year, but 31st March 2023 will be considered. So for the initial period, it can be as long as a 15 months, which can be a financial year period. Uh, then again, there are certain exemptions which is there for a financial year. Uh, so allowance of a period as financial year for a company or body corporate, uh, which is a holding company or a subsidiary or associate company uh, of a company which is incorporated outside India. So uh, there are certain uh, situations, there are certain uh, reasons why to which uh, as to when a company can opt to have a uh, different financial year, but the reason is has been very specifically defined in the, under the Act to mean that your holding or subsidiary or associate should be necessarily incorporated outside India. And since we know that for consolidation for a holding subsidiary or associate, uh, consolidation of accounts becomes mandatory. So for a ease of business, they are allowed to kind of change the financial year. And uh, a period of two years has been given by which the companies have to follow this financial year because under the 1956 Act, there were a lot of companies which uh, followed a different financial year. So a period of two years from when the Act came into force, it was given that everybody has to follow the 31st of March as the closure of the financial year. Uh, now, coming to the procedure of the change in financial year, as has already been mentioned, it is like financial year can be uh, changed only under one uh, situation. That is, we need to have a company or a entity incorporated outside India. So, first is we need to convene a board meeting and pass the resolution for uh, change. Uh, then file the adequate forms, that is the form MGT-14, the form uh, RD1, which has to be filed with the regional director, then the form GNL2, which has to be filed with the ROC with all the documents. Uh, then there is a small hearing at the regional director, wherein we will have to produce the facts as to why the company wants to adopt a different uh, financial year. And then after uh, hearing of the case, the RD has to dispose of the application, uh, either by having its additional questions or approving of the financial year. And uh, finally, the uh, order which is granting the approval has to be filed in INC 28. So again, a point of uh, discussion here might be, supposedly we have an entity which is a holding company which is uh, located outside India and we are following a separate financial year for consolidation purpose. What if that holding company ceases to exist? I mean, what if, what if the change has happened in the holding or the acquisition? For that matter, I will uh, just give you an example. Uh, previously, when the ACC and Ambuja Cement, they were controlled by a foreign entity. So they were following a financial year, uh, which was spreading from January to December. So they had the calendar year as the financial year. 
but uh, post their acquisition by Adani, they had to again go back to the financial year starting from the 1st of April till the 31st of March by following the procedure which has been displayed. So, as we know, financial year has been very specifically defined and we can deviate from the financial year only under specific situations and that situation has, has now been discussed. Somebody has put up a question actually. Company definition does not include foreign company and associate company definition does not use body corporate. Hence, how the foreign companies in an associate company perspective. And again, one more thing, you have given an example of the financial year. So he says, yes, they give us an example by you. Can we have the financial year ending 2022 only instead of 2023? That is 15 months. That is another thing which he is asking. And uh, uh, one, more yeah, one more associate question which is coming is, first January of the year, then what is the financial year for the purpose of income tax or uh, ITR is to be filed for the period or it can be for 15 extended period? So, so uh, see, uh, when we are discussing about a financial year, so I would put it in this way that we are getting the extent, we are getting a time period for 15 months, but the, it is the company's discretion as to when, if the, usually why this period has been given is because in an initial uh, stage of a company being incorporated, usually there are not much operations. So uh, until and unless the business operations commence, it is difficult to kind of reflect that in the balance sheets or the financial statements. So uh, my point of view would be that there is no restriction as such that we cannot close it in the previous year, but the act gives us a leverage that we can take it up to the next year. See, what Aditi rightly said that if a company is incorporated, say, in the month, in the year of February, for two months, if you close the financial year, then what will happen is the subsequent compliances, like holding an annual general meeting, drafting a ports report, drafting all the other things in the annual report, they're all required. But a company which is in the infancy stages, that they can avoid all these things, but that's why in the act itself, it was provided that for that first, when the company was incorporated like this, the first financial year will be next year, that is in okay, year March 23. It may be more than 12 months, it may be 11 months, 12 months, 13 months, financial year like that. Yeah. You're absolutely right, Sudhagar. It is actually having in mind the ease of doing the business in the initial session when the company starts. This concession has been actually given by the company side. But as Aditi puts it, if you want to do the excessive compliance, if you want to close, you are free to do it. There's nothing is actually Correct. prohibiting you, actually. And second only, they are talking about the income tax related one. What do we do with the income tax? Whether income tax is to be done? I don't think, as far as the income tax is concerned, you have to refer to the income tax rules. And uh, even there also, I don't think for two months you have to file an income tax return. But I am not very thorough with income tax provisions. So one need to refer to that. It is better refer to that income tax provisions. And uh, not necessarily income tax and companies act have to go together. They are entirely different for tax purposes. You can always have a different financial year also. What Aditi is talking about financial year is strictly for the purpose of Companies Act. Yeah, you're as far right. as the income tax is concerned, you can have a different financial year altogether. I think as far as the income tax is concerned, even if it is two months, you will have to file that is mandatory because I remember that time when I went actually abroad, it was only the two months period, but I want to file the return for the two months period telling the purpose for them. That is what they have actually told, not waiting for the till the end. So uh, I think to the, the best of my knowledge, income no, tax no. is mandatorily 31st of uh, March every year. That is the thing. Any Correct. chartered accountant is there in this forum, they can actually explain. I more agree. I agree with I, you, I think, uh, if we are not sure, we will not comment on this. So we can go ahead in that case. Yeah. Okay. But somebody has actually put up here ITR filing mandatory even for the two months. Okay, fine. Thanks for your participation. Yeah. 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 Yes, Aditi, go ahead. Yes. Uh, so now, pursuant to the change in financial year, all the compliances and filings have to be done according to the changed financial year. 
And uh, one point of contention here is when we are talking about statutory auditors. So statutory auditors are appointed in the annual general meeting and their uh, tenure uh, extends up to the sixth annual general meeting from when he is appointed. So the change in financial year will not any way hamper his appointment as an auditor and he continues to uh, audit the accounts as per the tenure of appointment. Uh, now coming to the section uh, 2, subsection 43, which is talking about free reserves. So free reserves, if we know, had been uh, defined previously in 1956, but there has been a substantial change to what has been done in 2013. So 2013 is very clear when we are talking about free reserves. Any, as per your latest audited uh, balance sheet of a company, uh, whatever reserves are available for your distribution of dividend, they are to be considered as free reserves. So when we are looking at section 2, subsection 43, we have to read it in consonance with section 123, which talks about a distribution of dividend. So following uh, shall not be treated as free reserves, uh, which is like any amount which is representing unrealized gains, notional gains or revaluation of assets, uh, whether shown as reserve or otherwise. And uh, any change in carrying amount of an asset or of a liability which is recognized in the equity side, uh, including any surplus in profit and loss account on measurement of the asset or liability at fair value. So, uh, again, a point of contention here is uh, whether the surplus, the surplus that is arising out of the profit, so will that be considered for the purpose of free reserves? So here what we do is we go back to section 123. Now 123 is very clear when it says that uh, no dividend will be paid out of reserves other than free reserves. And when we are talking about the distribution, it is very clear that it can be paid only out of the profits of this current year or the profits of previous year after taking into consideration the depreciation that needs to be accounted for as per the schedule two. So when we have a profit, it is only the profits which is available for distribution of profit that uh, for distribution of dividend that only can be considered as a part of free reserves. Uh, now, if we look at the uh, definition that was previously there in 1956, we, we see that free reserves had a wider meaning here, wherein even share premium account was included as a part of the definition, but it did not include uh, reserves which was created out of uh, revaluation of assets, write back of depreciation, provisions and amalgamation. So uh, analysis of free reserves, I would say one major change that has happened between uh, 1956 and 2013 is the transition, uh, the use of the word share premium which was initially there in 1956 in the current uh, 2013 Act, share premium account is not available for payment of dividend. Hence, it does not qualify to become a free reserves. Uh, so free reserves has been used in a few sections in the Companies Act. So uh, it is like when we talk about uh, section uh, 63 that talks of for bonus issue, section 68 for buyback of uh, shares, uh, section uh, 180 and 186, wherein we will have to derive the limits. So these are the places where free reserves have been exhaustively used in the Act. So we can treat it as something which is only used for distribution of dividend. Uh, now moving ahead, uh, going to holding company. So holding company is what? Uh, section uh, 2, subsection 46 says that in relation to one or more other companies, if a company in relation to one or more other companies, it becomes a holding company if such companies are subsidiary companies. So again, I will tell it in this way that they've not put here the definition, but when we refer back to the subsidiary company definition, we will be able to understand what this holding company is. So if a company is having a subsidiary company, then it becomes a holding company. So uh, just to give a few examples of uh, holding companies in India, uh, Aditya Birla Group, Mahindra Group, Tata Group, 
uh, Reliance, ITC. So all of these are the holding companies which have uh, a lot of subsidiaries below them. And uh, now to kind of cite a very important case law here, which we had uh, uh, initially discussed when we were discussing on associate companies also. So a Supreme Court in the case of uh, Vodafone International Holdings, BV versus Union of India, he had held very specifically that there is a legal relationship between a holding and its wholly owned subsidiary or a subsidiary, but they both are two distinct legal persons. So it is like you are responsible as a holding company for up to a certain extent, you are responsible for the functioning of the subsidiary, but not beyond that. The subsidiary continues to be a, a legal entity on its own. So the company has a separate legal existence, irrespective of whether one person or one company owns all of its shares. Uh, now, moving ahead. Uh, we will be talking about uh, net worth. Uh, Aditi, one minute. There is a question. Is balance in PLN treated as free reserve? Uh, Ms. Deepika, would you like to say? No, uh, as, as we just mentioned, that uh, this was very clearly captured uh, when Aditi mentioned it. She said that the, the definition very clearly states that the surplus that's available um, under balance sheet, which uh, comes out of the profit and loss account, will not be considered under the free services. Thanks. And that's kind of clearly given under the definition. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. Yeah, Aditi, go ahead. Uh, so, yes, moving ahead, uh, we go to net worth. Uh, so section uh, 2 subsection 56 talks about net worth. Again, uh, a huge change has happened from 1956 to 2013. So uh, now when we talk about net worth here, it is including the paid up share capital, reserves created out of profit and securities premium account and debit or credit balance of profit and loss account. So when we are looking into the net worth, basically the entire equity side, the reserves and surplus, as well as the paid up capital is to be considered. And for uh, regards to deductions, uh, accumulated profit, uh, deferred expenditure or miscellaneous expenditure not written off, these will not be considered. So if these also, if any of these points are forming a part of the uh, asset size, then these uh, will not be considered and we will only focus upon the reserves and surplus, which is securities premium or debit credit of the profit and the paid up share capital. Vis-a-vis, uh, -vis, if we look at the Companies Act 1956, free reserve was a part of uh, net worth and paid up share capital and free reserve had been differently defined under 1956 and deductions were only provisions or expenses. So, as of now, we will have to consider what is there in the 2013 Act. Okay. So, uh, when we talk about net worth, I would just say that Section 135, which is Corporate Social Responsibility, though, uh, that is one of the major sections where we will have to compute the net worth. And there are certain other sections also. For example, 180, where an undertaking has to be uh, like deduced from the kind of uh, percentage of uh, holding of net worth. And also section 76, when we talk about deposits. So there in all of these sections, the uh, mention of net worth comes into picture. Uh, so officer and default uh, to subsection 60, it is very specifically mentioned in Companies Act 2013. Before there was no person who was uh, completely liable to a penalty or punishment in case of default. But Companies Act has now made it very clear that officer in default shall be a whole time director, shall be a key managerial personnel. If there is no key uh, key managerial personnel, then any specific director, all, all directors, in case of no specified directors. Uh, it can be any person who has been charged with responsibility for compliances. It can be any person under whose advice or instruction the board is custom to act, but not in the professional capacity or uh, every director having a knowledge or acted in connivance or contravention, a share transfer agent, registrar or merchant banker for contravention of issue or transfer. So if we look at the definition of the officer in default, 
these people have been very specifically defined that in case there is a default arising in an entity, so these are the people who are to be held responsible. Now, uh, coming to KMP, Key Managerial Personnel. So, Key Managerial Personnel has been further defined in under Section 2, Subsection 51. So, it means a Chief Executive Officer or the Managing Director or the Manager, the Company Secretary, the whole time director, the chief finance officer, and such other officer not more than one level below the directors who is in whole time employment, who has been designated as a key managerial personnel by the board. So uh, why KMP is being defined here? Why? Because KMP qualifies to be an officer in default if a KMP is in place. Now, Coming to certain decided cases, so it is in Ravindra Narayan versus Registrar of Companies. It's a very important judgment. Why? Because when we read through the officer in default uh, definition, it was very specific that in case certain person has not been given the charge of being an officer in default, then all the directors would become the officers in default. So a similar uh, matter had happened wherein the High Court of Rajasthan held that the directors are officer in default only where company does not have managing director, whole time director or manager. Because when the company has these positions by virtue of them qualifying to be a KMP, they become the officers in default and the other directors are not liable for them. So this, uh, this judgment was again upheld by the Gujarat High Court as well wherein an inspection was carried out in that company. And it was held that since the company had a managing director, it will not be any other directors, but the officer in default as has been defined under the act. So now it is very clear that anyone who has been given the responsibility either by the board as an officer in default or the ones which has been defined uh, by the Companies Act will only qualify to become officer in default. Uh, now we come to a very important question here. Again, a contentious issue is that, suppose we take, for example, a private company. So private company is not bound by Section 203. A private company is not required to appoint a KMP. And KMP happens to qualify as an officer in default. So there might be certain cases wherein a private company has appointed a company secretary, but in case of a default has happened in that private company, the company secretary might say that I am not the officer in default because I am not a KMP. Or the chief finance officer might also say that I am not the officer in default because I am not a KMP. But we have a decided NCLAT case here, which very clearly states that NCLAT has held here that Section 203 should be followed where a private company even voluntarily chooses to appoint a KMP. So irrespective of the fact whether that section is applicable to you or not as an entity, if voluntarily you are wanting to follow a certain section, you have to abide by the provisions which has been laid down in the law. Aditi, I would like to add here that this means that because of this uh, case, it is clear that if a private company appoints a company secretary, even if not voluntarily, but under Rule 8A, that appointment seems to be false under the KMP position and they have to ensure the necessary compliances. When we are talking about they have to ensure necessary compliances, it means that Section 203 compliances as far as the appointment of KMP, whether we need to comply with that? This is a question of debate. The reason being, this is a contentious issue. The clarity is not there. Technically, if you say that when 203 gets triggered, then only we need to appoint KMPs. By merely, if I appoint a company secretary or a CFO, who are falling under the definition of section 2, subsection 52, whether they are KMP still recently, we were there were two schools of thought. One school of thought used to say that they are KMPs because by definition itself it is so. 
second school of thought is only when section 203 triggers i have to ensure the necessary compliances but now what happens is ncLAT has decided that even if you appoint a cfo or a cs or a, a managing director whoever it is on even if on a voluntary basis they fall under the different they, they are uh, as kmps now the question comes if they are kmps while appointing them, do I need to comply 203 provisions? Again, it, there is a question of contentious because I can say that, look, 203 is not applicable to me. Why I have to comply with that section? So the clarity is not there. It is a debatable issue. How the regulator will view, we don't know. One way of looking at it is, no doubt they may say it is a KMP for the purpose of officer at default. That's it only. But 203 compliances are required. I am not sure about that. My personal view is it is not required. But how the regulator will view, we don't know that. So some kind of a clarity is required. Till such time, by abundant caution, better to comply with the related provisions also. When you are in doubt, better comply. This is the principle which we have adopted right from 2014 onwards. We may continue with the same thing. You're so, right. Aditi, one more thing I would like to add for that officer in default. If you can go to your slide, the first slide of officer in default. Any person charged with responsibility for compliance by board, stroke KMP. So, here what happens is a question comes that, say, for example, if a person has been charged with the compliances under the Factories Act, whether that person will be responsible as officer in default is a question. Okay. So the answer to that, according to me, is when we talk about officer in default under Section 2, Subsection 60, it confines only to the provisions related or any kind of non compliances, offenses, defaults related to Companies Act only. Not it, We cannot extend this to the other laws. For example, Section 1. 149 subsection 12, it insulates the independent directors from certain liabilities. That insulation is available only for the liabilities arising out of Companies Act, not under the other laws. That one need to be careful about. Yeah, you're okay? right. Absolutely, you're right. And yeah. another thing is coming to the question, how the regulator looks at the voluntary appointment of the company secretaries, where the section 203 is not uh, triggered, the thinking of the regulator is the moment you appoint the person by virtue of the definition, he is a KMP. I think that is the stand which has been taken because a couple of cases I dealt with when we had issues. He told very clearly, the moment you appoint him, he is coming under the definition of KMP. That is the stand they have taken. Not one ROC, about three ROC they have taken the same stand. Okay, there is also a question, two, three questions come by now is, when you are telling KMP, you are mentioning whole time employment. There are questions that uh, because in certain company, the CFO and CS is same whether it is a compliance of section 251 and 203. Strictly speaking, when you talk about the whole time employment, my view, to the best of my understanding, the position should be different. But as the participants puts it, in some of the companies, the combined position do exist. Even in the listed companies, it do exist. But we don't know unless it is goes without noticing by the regulator, there is nothing. Once it comes, we will have to see how the things are taken. What do you say, Sudhagar? In fact, when this question came up in the 2014, that time itself, we have examined that and according to me, my view is that we are not supposed to have these two positions together. There should be individual positions. You cannot have a CEO and a, who is a qualified company secretary and he is also a chartered accountant. So you will combine all the three and you say by he is a KMP, CEO come, CS come, CFO. Technically, it is not correct according to me, but as you rightly said, there are some listed companies who are having this uh, I mean, dual positions held by one particular person only. 
how the regulator so far he has not taken up this particular thing in the last 10 years but that doesn't mean they will not take up in future yeah till that time till that time it is permitted it is not objected you may continue but the question is that suppose if the regulator says it is a non-compliance, then what will happen? How you will defend yourself? I'm sure that these listed companies who are having one person holding two positions, I don't know. Say, for example, you may say that I'm a company secretary come CFO, but they might have appointed another company secretary as the KMP. Okay, so this gentleman, though he is a company secretary and CFO, you can have a company can have two or more company secretaries also. And you can have a joint company secretary concept is there. So I don't know whether these companies which are having a CFO come see us, whether they have appointed another company secretary as a KMP company secretary, I don't know that. I have seen in one of the public... Again, uh, again see, Bala, Bala, again it is a contentious issue because See, what happened is initially we used to say that if a company is having two CFOs, the company can decide which CFO is the KMP and file the DIR-12 accordingly, the other CFO. But after this NCLAT case, the moment you designated a person as a company secretary or as a CFO, he becomes a KMP. So again, there is a lot of confusion is there. The clarity is not there according to me. So till such time, the way the things are going, let them go. But be yes, cautious Deepika, about it. Yes, Deepika, your comment, please. Yeah, uh, I was actually, as I hear uh, Bala sir and uh, Sudhakar sir, I really see this to be a very practical uh, perspective that, uh, you know, a CFO who's qualified and who's capable enough to handle a secretarial work also can be designated as a company secretary. But from a very simplistic uh, uh, answers that I was just thinking around uh, as I hear, uh, I think somewhere MC has answered these by having these regulatory filings which we are required to do. DIR 12, when you file for your appointment, you are indicated under your master data or, your, or on the company's master data about who the key MP is. In one specific position, like we talk about CFO and CS being held by a single individual, we have this designation of MD and CEO held by a single individual. Now, CEO is a KMP. MD, of course, is a KMP and he also happens to be on the board of the uh, company. When we do these filings, if you see on the master data, it reflects the same person's name as a director under DIN. And uh, with his PAN, he's indicated as a KMP. So I was practically thinking of a situation where the companies are designating CFO as a CS also. How are they really achieving this filing uh, requirements? Are they, are they filing the... Uh, sorry. Are they filing DIR-12 with the same individual's name as a CFO and CS uh, or how that is being achieved? That was first thought that I had in my mind. And uh, while I was hearing the question about the fact that uh, a, a private company, which is currently not required to appoint uh, a company secretary, but happens to appoint a company secretary, will this person be treated as a, as a KMP? My thoughts around here was, again, when you appoint certain person as a company secretary, you take up your board resolution and then file this resolution with MCA. Once you've done that, you voluntarily submit it to the fact that this person becomes uh, uh, becomes a KMP. Uh, ruling out the the dichotomy that, you know, I was not required to appoint a company secretary, but yet I appointed and I will not call this person as a KMP. So I thought when a company picks it up voluntarily, uh, should uh, then be obliged to assume the obligations of uh, an officer in default as a KMP. Th that's my thought, I mean. Okay. In fact, in a public balance sheet, it is available in the public domain. Anybody can see a person actually writes his name in the balance sheet and he puts below him chief financial officer, company secretary, and the compliance officer. It's available. As the right. puts it, so long as it goes unnoticed, you enjoy. The moment it comes, we don't know, we don't see the consequences. True. One more thing I would like to add here is that suppose if some eminent listed company has done something that doesn't mean that is the law or that is the yeah. way you will interpret the law. The reason being, they might have taken a legal opinion before taking up action. So tomorrow, if the regulator come and put the question, they can defend themselves. So without understanding that, if you simply 
same that you know, follow them without having proper understanding. And if the regulator comes, if you are not able to answer the question, the regulator will uh, trigger the, I mean, he will impose the penal provisions. And especially these days, the regulators, by dropping of a hat, they are triggering the penal provisions and very stringent penal provisions also. So one needs to be very careful about doing these kind of experiments. Better interpret the law very conservatively. In fact, at Reliance, I remember that we decided that we will interpret the law very conservatively. If at all there is a benefit of doubt is there and there is a question mark on that, better not to take the benefit of such kind of provisions. And uh, I was just adding, in each case, the facts of the case is different. So we don't always know entire facts. So accordingly, the call name to be. If you are taking new definition, we missed certain questions of earlier on your slide. Sorry for that. The for buyback of shares, free reserve has same meaning or any inclusion exclusion? For free reserve definition, it was there. For buyback of shares. Same meaning? Uh, yes, so free reserves has been defined uh, in the Act and for the purpose of these sections, it has to be read as to how it has been defined. Okay. Network uh, means, shall we include the retained earning? Retained earning. So, uh, retained earning is a part of uh, surplus only, sir. Yeah, yeah. Uh, retained correct. earning will either be on the general reserve or in the profit and loss and carry forward balance, no? Correct. Now, for Correct. network, network uh, question, forest fluctuation reserve be treated for network calculation? No, it should not be. No. Accumulated profit should be part of network? Yeah, yes, yes, it, sir. It, is, it is, it is, it yeah. is. No doubt. Okay, that's all. Go ahead. One more question was there, whether... The company secretary can be director of the company where he or she is the company secretary. Of course, of course, you can. Of course, ma'am, yes. Very there is no restriction as such. It will director be. can be. Okay, now go ahead. Uh, yes, so moving ahead uh, with the definition of private company. Uh, private company means a company which by its articles, uh, there are three things. First is it restricts the right to transfer its shares. It prohibits any invitation to the public to subscribe for any securities or it limits the number of its members to 200. So again, there has been a substantial change from 1956 to 2013. So 1956, when we look at it, uh, the minimum paid up capital uh, was restricted to 1 lakh or more, which is no more there in Companies Act 2013. And the limit of members, which was 50, in the 56 Act has now gone up to 200. Uh, now, when we look at the number of 200, there are certain things that we have to uh, uh, not include in that. So uh, one is that when we have like, uh, there are two persons, two persons who have uh, jointly holding a company, uh, jointly holding shares in the company, they shall be treated as a single member. They will not be treated as two different uh, members for that purpose. And there are further persons who are in the employment of the company or they might be in employment when they were members and they have ceased to become but continue to be members of the company. So in these two cases, these will not be included in the number of members and the tally uh, of 200 will not be calculated for these purposes. Apart from that, it is restricting the number of members to 200. Uh, so there are a few additional points when we are reading uh, a private company. So section three, subsection one is saying that it may be formed for any lawful person by two or more persons. So it, a private company can be incorporated with two shareholders and every private company shall have a minimum two directors in its board with section uh, 149, subsection one is specifying. And it is required to add the words private limited at the end of its name, which 41A is say. Aditya, I'll just to take one minute. Sure, sir. I just to open a particular company where the position of CFO and the CEO, they are occupying the same position. 
Deepika raised the question of finding out by DR12, how it is done, etc. and other thing and all. When I checked here, I am actually finding under the director's details name, this person name is appearing twice. Under one head, it is appearing company secretary. And the other head, it is appearing CFO. That means they seem to have filed two DR12 forms separately, one for the position of CFO, one for the position of CS. The position is not combined. That means a combination of the form, I don't think the company law will permit to be filed. That's what I think so. Correct me if I'm wrong. So you're right, sir. I, I think the point taken, uh, I'm just wondering, uh, they've not set in, set in the uh, restrictions to state that a single individual uh, cannot hold both the positions, uh, even through the forms. Yeah, that uh, is the thing, because the form itself, it is not there. There are two uh, different places, his same name is appearing, one under the CS, one under the CFO. Yeah, and hence I was drawing the distinction between an MD and CEO, where yeah. uh, as an MD, he's a board member, uh, against whose name DIN will appear. And whereas in the case of uh, CEO, PAN will appear. But if you talk about CFO and CS position, both will appear under the same yeah. PAN. And yeah, IR12 is getting really accepted. So, I mean, something yeah. that even the MCA in the form filings, etc., they can uh, trigger and... In case that is to be restricted, they can be, it can be done over there. I think but probably it will come up. That's what I think so. Yeah. Understood. Yeah. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, yeah. So now Go moving ahead. ahead. Yeah. Uh, we come to a very important defi uh, definition of that of promoter. So uh, when we look at 1956, promoter was something which was uh, defined as a person who was just a party to the preparation of the prospectus. Uh, but it has been very specifically defined when we look at Companies Act 2013. So, two subsection 69 is saying, uh, promoter means a person who has been named as such in the prospectus or identified in the annual return. So, uh, annual return is the uh, return that every company is uh, required to file after holding of the annual general meeting. So, therein there is a specific uh, section wherein we will have to define who the promoter group belongs or how many uh, members are promoters and what is the kind of percentage of shares that they are holding. So, it is like they have to be identified. Then secondly, they, they are ones who have the power to control the board of directors or on whose advice the board is accustomed to work or else they are who have control over the affairs of the company directly or indirectly, whether as a shareholder, director or otherwise. So here otherwise maybe can be it. So uh, can be interpreted that maybe by way of an arrangement or an agreement that they have entered into the company, they can they can become a promoter. But one important thing here is if somebody is kind of catering to the needs of the company and giving professional service or advice, then in the professional capacity, his services will be defined and he will not be categorized as a promoter of that company. So, as a promoter, there are certain rights. Uh, so, the promoters have a right to receive the preliminary expenses. They have a right to indemnity. They have a right to receive remuneration for the services and right to recover proportionate amount from the co-promoters. So, usually if we go by a normal definition of what a promoter is. It is someone who is, uh, who is uplifting the company or who is bringing the company into existence. So it can be anyone, a shareholder, a director, or in any other capacity. So they have a right over all of these things in the capacity of a promoter. And along with rights, they also have certain liabilities. So as a promoter, they have an additional responsibility because even if their name is not uh, uh, going when we are incorporating a company, but by virtue of them holding either shares or being directors of a company, they become uh, either subscribers to the memorandum. So they are kind of identified as subscribers to the memorandum. So they become the shareholder or the promoter. So uh, what are the liabilities of a promoter? They are liable because of the fiduciary relationship that they have. They are liable for any misstatement in the prospectus. Their liability is on insolvency. If there is a death of a promoter uh, winding up of a company, 
or they are also liable in case of uh, furnishing uh, false or incorrect information for incorporation of a company. So uh, being a promoter, it is a very, uh, it's a kind of a fiduciary relationship it enjoys. Therefore, with the rights, along with the rights comes a lot of liabilities as well. So the position of promoter is a very, uh, uh, very, very kind of a difficult uh, role to play. So anyone who is promoting a company or is declaring himself as a promoter has to have all of these points in his mind. Uh, now, moving on to a public company, uh, Section 2, Subsection 71 of Companies Act, it uh, defines a company as not a private company. So, any company which is not a private company can be categorized as a public company. And one very important point here is a company which is a subsidiary of a company not being a private company shall become a deemed public company. So, for example, if there is a public company which is having a subsidiary and that subsidiary is a private company, then by virtue of it being a subsidiary, it shall become a deemed private company. So, after becoming, uh, after it is deemed to be a public company, all the compliances of the public company shall become to the, uh, shall become applicable to the private company as though it has become a public company. Uh, so, again, in uh, 1956 Act, uh, there was a minimum uh, paid up capital of 5 lakh rupees and the that has not been uh, captured in section, I mean, in the current uh, Companies Act. So that has now been omitted. Uh, looking at a few other uh, points for a public company, a public company may be formed for any lawful purpose by seven or more persons. Uh, while it was two for private companies, for public it is seven. They need to have a minimum of three directors in the board and they need to have uh, they need to add the words limited at the end of its name. So as regards uh, the restriction which is there for the public company, uh, for the private company, a public company can freely transfer its shares to the public and only the shares of a public company are capable of being dealt on the stock exchange. So any company which is wanting to go on the stock exchange or listed shares necessarily has to be a public company. So examples of few public companies in India, Reliance Industries, Indian Oil Corporation, Bharat Petrol, uh, Petroleum, Coal India Limited. Uh, any questions or we move ahead? Uh, so moving ahead, uh, we go to the definition of uh, Section 2, Subsection 77 of Companies Act, the meaning of relative. So, uh, it is very important for us to understand relative and related parties are two different terms as are defined. So, relative here, a person shall be deemed to be a relative of another if they are members of a, a Hindu undivided family or husband or wife or one is related to the other in the manner indicated in the schedule. So, uh, going by this uh, schedule which is there, uh, when we look at the list of relatives as per 1956, I would say it was a very, very long list, but 2013 had become a more concise. So uh, as per uh, 2013, the relatives uh, definition of relative boils down to the members of uh, a Hindu undivided family. So husband and wife, that is spouse become relatives, uh, father and mother, son and his wife, daughter and her husband brother and sister, stepfather, stepmother, stepson, stepbrother, and stepsister. So it has it has kind of uh, narrowed down that it is the immediate family inclusive of the stepfather, mother, son, brother, and sister. So uh, for the purpose of 2013, these are the relatives. Uh, now going to the definition of securities, the word securities has been used at different uh, places in the Companies Act. So it is very important uh, to understand that securities does not only confine itself to shares of a company, but it is uh, way more than what uh, has been uh, given in the, uh, in the structure of shares. So securities uh, as per 2 subsection 82 of Companies Act, uh, securities means the securities as defined in Clause H of Section 2 of Securities Contract Regulation Act 1956. 
So companies act as silent on the definition of securities and uh, it is linking the definition to that that we derive from clause H of section 2 of SICRA Act. So uh, how it has been defined under that particular act, it is shares, scripts, stocks, bonds, debentures and debenture stocks. So all of it has been defined as securities. Uh, units or any other instruments by CIS scheme, security receipts, rights or interest in securities, government securities, other securities as may be declared by the central government and derivatives. So it is basically when we look at the definition of securities, it is whatever is available for trading in the market, I would say it is inclusive of derivatives, it is inclusive of debentures, it is inclusive of debenture stocks. So all of it comes into picture when we are looking at securities as a definition. It is not just restricted to shares or debentures of a company. Uh, now coming to the definition of a small company, uh, section 2, subsection 85 of Companies Act has uh, defined small company, which means any company which is not a public company whose paid up share capital does not exceed 4 crores, which shall at any time not be more than 10 crores. So paid up capital is 4 crores and the maximum limit is 10 crores and turnover is 40 crores and the maximum limit is 100 uh, crores. So if these two criteria is met and it is not a public company, then it qualifies to be a small company. So uh, there is something which is uh, uh, not included or which is uh, not getting certain categories which are not getting applicable to this particular section. So it can be a company or body corporate which is governed by a special act. So not specifically falling under the Companies Act, which is kind of governed or ruled by another special act. They can be termed as a small, they cannot be termed as a small company. Company registered under Section 8 and holding or subsidiary company. So these are the sections, uh, these are the categories of companies which do not qualify as small companies. Apart from these, if any private company having qualifying the paid up share capital or turnover, they become small company. Uh, so now just to understand, uh, is the entity, uh, so is the entity a private limited company? So if it is private, then uh, if it is private, then yes, it becomes, if it is not a private, then it is not a small company. If it is a private, we will have to check on the paid up and annual turnover. If it is triggering the limits that has been given in the section, then it qualifies to become a small company as per the Companies Act. So uh, as a small company also, there are certain exemptions and privileges which is given. So that is why this uh, there is a special category which has been termed as small companies. So they have been given certain uh, exemptions with uh, regards to uh, holding of your uh, board meetings or certification in the annual return, which the other companies are required to do. They have to do it slightly on the lower side of it. But I think the question is why the Section 8 exemption, uh, as you rightly mentioned, the exemption is as regards compliance, certain compliances, if I understand, and Section 8 company has a corpus from the public and that's why two they are uh, interested. This again, I should not comment because we don't have authenticated any reason, but can be considered as that uh, better compliance is to ensure they must have an exam. Uh, now coming to the uh, definition of subsidiary company. They are asking so I... what, what about the companies converted from public to private company, which is within the limit, but still it would be a small company or not. Uh, so, sir, when we are judging the position of a small company, I think at that point of time only we will have to see the nature of the uh, company. Somebody has put a question actually. Can you explain the expression at any time in the definition of the small company? I think uh, the question is you have to take together. You are actually right because at the time when you are assessing whether what is the status of the company. On, on the definition of small company, uh, uh, nothing. I think it was rightly appropriately put here. Okay. okay. Yeah. Can you give an example of the company which are governed by the special act? Somebody is asking. Uh, 
a special act sir i i mean a special act as in company uh, cooperative societies they will not be falling under this because it has a separate act of its uh, special act can be uh, like nhb <coughs> act sbi act sbi right uh, so now moving on to subsidiary company uh, section 2 subsection 86 87 of companies act uh, defines a subsidiary company so subsidiary company is one in which the holding company controls the composition of the board of directors or exercises or controls more than one half of the total voting power either at its own or together with one or more of its subsidiary companies. So, uh, to understand uh, the definition of section 280, uh, subsection 87, uh, it is like a company which is controlling the composition of the board of directors of another company, or it is exercising or controlling more than 50% more than of the total voting power. So, then it qualifies to become a holding company and it has to be together with one or more of its subsidiary companies. So, if we are, uh, we are kind of qualifying all of these points, then the company can be uh, considered as a subsidiary company. Now, some points which needs to be considered about a subsidiary company is a subsidiary company cannot have shares in its holding company. So, uh, a very important point here is holding companies holding more than 50% of shares in the subsidiary company, but a subsidiary company cannot have shares in its holding company. So, though cross-holding is not permitted between a holding and a subsidiary company. So, basically, if we look at a structure, uh, maybe a holding structure of Tata company or any uh, Reliance Industries, any big... Uh, a uh, company for that matter, there are many cross holdings between companies. That is, uh, for example, uh, company A is having some shares in company B. Company B is also holding some shares in company A. But what we have to kind of examine here is that A and B are not having the status of a holding and a subsidiary company. So if they become a holding and subsidiary company, then subsidiary company is not allowed to hold back any shares in the holding company. But uh, one thing which is uh, very important, uh, one thing which is very important for us to understand here is, supposedly we have a company which is already holding shares in the holding company before it becomes its subsidiary. So will it still continue to hold those shares? Will they have the voting rights uh, uh, like will they have the voting rights for the percentage of that shareholding? So here the answer is uh, if a company is already holding shares in a holding company, they continue to hold that shares. But when it comes to the voting power, when it comes to exercising their right, there is certain restrictions to it. So uh, there is no cross holding, uh, cross holdings between a holding and subsidiary is not allowed. But so now if I say a holding company is kind of uh, giving uh, they, so the subsidiary companies will not be eligible for any bonus issues. They will not be eligible for any rights issues because by virtue of them becoming a subsidiary company, they no more can hold additional shares in the holding company. Uh, so now a few examples about uh, subsidiary companies. We can say Tata Sons is the holding company. And it has a lot of subsidiaries for that matter, wherein uh, the control or exercise is more than 50%. Uh, Tata Technologies, Tata Power, Tata Chemicals, TCS, Tata Communications. So this is all by virtue of exercising the control of more than 50% uh, of the voting uh, rights or because they are managing the board, of, uh, the board composition of these following companies that they have established the relationship between Tata Sons and uh, the other companies. Coming to a conclusion, uh, thank you. So, Bala sir, uh, we, uh, Bala sir and madam, we can just have one more question here. So, can LLP be a subsidiary? I think that is one of the most uh, debated uh, topics here today. So, uh, LLP has always been uh, something which is looked upon as a separate thing from the Companies Act because it has a separate act of its own. 
so can llp be defined as a subsidiary because when it comes to consolidation of accounts now we are sure that consolidation is required but consolidation will only come into account if they are qualifying to be a subsidiary so uh, so if you would like to take this uh, question whether subsidiaries can be a llp can llp be a subsidiary in fact you discussed this llp in the equally or to proceed under the slide institute of chartered accountants of india frequent question when you are asked when you say the body corporate the word doesn't use this any body corporate will use here so llb comes under that that is what you actually said the only question which you have to take is consolidation when it is done whether it is required to be done by line by line consolidation or it is required to be done the overall consolidation that is what the question will arise actually here what do you say deepika that's right, sir. I think we discussed this in the context of associate company as well. When it comes to a subsidiary, I think the position is clear that it has to be a line-by-line -line consolidation. Uh, whereas for an associate company, it is it is not. Um, on the concept that uh, Aditi is mentioning about the LLP's precarious position, where, uh, you know, uh, in, in today's day, wherever you see very large entities, I'm sure in a, in, in, in they have a group of uh, companies and many of those entities are LLPs because LLPs did have that kind of exemption earlier because we didn't have a clarity on uh, the concept of body corporate and whether it is to be treated as a subsidiary or no. Uh, I understand that's the point of contention that uh, Aditi wants uh, wants us to discuss and uh, analyze. Um, I believe in today's position, I'm not too uh, uh, not too sure on uh, the section references but uh, the position legal position today seems to be clear that llps where they where the holding is up to 50 percent and more they have to be uh you know uh, be treated on par uh, as a subsidiary company uh that's my limited submission uh but i'd like to hear more from uh, deepthi ma'am perhaps uh, as to how uh, our participant are active mr jambunath has referred uh, to one article which is there in website. So participants, you can refer that for further inputs. Thank you, Mr. Jamunar. Uh, now, I think we have covered all the questions and uh, we can now allow the participants to, you know, raise the, we will allow them to speak. No, I can see yes. Jamunar and Krishnan. Yeah, I just wanted to say that since we cannot see the others chat, so what I send cannot be seen by them. So this is an article about whether LLP as a subsidiary, you can go to, it's written well by our uh, dear member Makaran, and it's clearly held that it is not under section 287. So I think Deepthi can probably forward this link to whom so. Yeah, yeah, sure, yeah. sure. Yeah, okay, that's all. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Jabbaratan. Mr. Krishnan, Krishnan, can you talk? Yeah. Uh, Yes, sir. Am I audible, sir? Yeah, very yeah. much. Yeah. See, uh, I just have a doubt. Uh, actually, in the definition of an associate company, there is no uh, specific mention of uh, foreign company. There is no specific mention either in favor of or uh, not in favor of a foreign company. So, I just wanted clarity as to whether foreign company will also be included in the definition we of an associate company. Mr. Krishnan, this topic, because there was a, again a subsidiary and all that, we said that yeah. we park and come back to you. That yeah. will be answered because okay. somebody else has already raised this question. Okay, and one more question is regarding uh, free reserves. Uh, free reserves for the purpose of dividend, it is clearly defined in the act that only you can distribute only out of the available profits. But in general, what is the definition of free reserves? So what is, I mean, what is uh, generally considered as free reserves? Free reserve is the one which is available for the distribution of the dividends, which is not specifically more for any other purpose. That will actually consider for the free reserve. But the only okay. thing is, as Aditi has said clearly, in case of the buyback and other issues, etc., how to, because mm -hmm. the position arises only on the security premium. Because security okay. premium is excluded in the Companies Act 2013, because mm -hmm. which is not available for the free reserve as a dividend. Okay, okay. Barring the difference, other free reserve is which is available freely distributable, which is not earmarked for any particular purpose. That is what the free reserve is. Yeah. And, and uh, uh, one more thing, sir. Uh, 
Uh, what is exactly the difference between free reserves and uh, like reserves and surplus? I mean, both are the same, or uh, uh, there is some kind of you know subtle distinction, subtle distinction between those two. Free reserves and uh, uh, surplus reserves and surplus. See, free reserve and surplus. Sometimes company do what you call revaluation of the assets. They uh, generate, which is actually put as a revaluation reserve. Okay. Although that is appearing under the surplus, that is not available for the distribution of the profit for the free reserves. Okay. Okay. So surplus is the one which is actually featuring the balance sheet. Free reserves are the one which is available for only free distribution. Yeah. Okay. Okay, okay sir. Thank you. I think we answered the question. You, your comment, yeah, please. Uh, yeah, I, can, I can see Anand Kumar. You are yeah. there? Yeah. Yes, sir. Yeah. Am I audible? Yeah, very much. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, good afternoon, everyone. Yeah, I I had uh, just uh, uh, just an observation. I mean, now since this uh, today's session was on definitions, now I I am I am a chartered accountant uh, practicing as a, uh, mainly as an auditor in many companies. Now the definitions under the Companies Act uh, and under the uh, accounting standards, be it uh, IGAP or INDAS. In many cases, we see that uh, there are inconsistencies, like say the definition of KMP under the Companies Act and under INDAS. So these inconsistencies, first of all, uh, I fail to understand whether they are uh, uh, an oversight. If not an oversight, why they still uh, persist? Is there any specific reason or rationale that uh, two different, uh, completely different set of definitions under the standards and under the Companies Act now, for example, under KMP, uh, the Companies Act uh, defines certain positions as being KMPs. Now, under NDIS, the KMP de definition is, uh, you know, very, very verbose that anyone, whether directly or indirectly, who is uh, uh, responsible for managing the affairs of the company, planning, directing and controlling, he is deemed to be a KMP. So many companies, in fact, uh, even uh, top-notch uh, listed companies in the front, front line, they are so, uh, even showing independent directors under KMP. So, so every year we face situations where we have to get into elaborate discussions and hair splitting with the CFO and the management as to who will, uh, who will uh, form part of KMP. Because disclosures in financial statements are governed by the accounting standards. But uh, the oddity, he takes plea of the definition as given under the Companies Act. So my limited point is whether this, whether these uh, incongruities in the definitions are deliberate or are there any rationale for it? Uh, anyone panelists want to answer or otherwise we can't have... No, I'll tell you one thing very categorically. See, there are two things we have to understand. When we are talking about the Companies Act, we are talking mainly the compliances related part of it where the person is required to comply with the applicable laws which are pertaining to the company in respect to that they have identified those are the people who will be charged with the compliance but when it's come to the accounting standards because it is basically what is required to be disclosed to the stakeholders of the company it is a greater disclosure and transparency so naturally the definition which are actually put under the Accounting standard will be more wider than the company side because it is for the better disclosure and the transparency. There is no question of any inconsistency or something like that. When you talk about the independent director and other things are showing, but when you come to the company side, company side very category talks under sector 149 immunity to the indirect, uh, independent director and even non executive director who are not involved in the day to day operation. The purpose is actually totally different. There it is coming mainly on the disclosure purpose. Here it is coming at the compliance purpose. Okay, okay sir. Okay. Yeah. Thank, okay. You. Thank you. Yeah, is want to talk. Yeah, yes, yeah. Atish. Yeah, no, uh, it's me, sir. Actually, sir has gone out. So it's me. Uh, my my name is Komal. And I'm from Bangalore. Good, up, good afternoon, sir. So my question is on uh, appointment of KMP. So uh, KMP, if a company has appointed a CS uh, by virtue of uh, Rule 8, a so uh, so uh, Sudhakar sir says that uh, it, it should be in the line of uh, 203 section 203 correct 
Yeah. So in that case, uh, do we need to appoint the CFO and managing director as well? So uh, basically, is that a relevant to definition or to, because this is a different section you are referring. Yeah. If it's relevant to definition, interpretation, please stick to that question. Oh, it's not I, definition, ma'am. Yeah, uh, please. Yeah. It's not definition. See, rule as per rule 8A, eh, we need to appoint a... Uh, yeah, uh, yeah, I, I got No, no, it. I got your point, what you are saying. What you are saying is when you are appointed the CS, whether other position is to be appointed. That is the question you are asking. Yeah, when you are talking correct. about the compliance with 203, that compliance of 203 is restricted to the appointment what you have done voluntarily. If you are not done voluntarily other appointments, there is no question arises. If you have done voluntarily CS, 203 applies. Similarly, if you voluntarily appoint CFO, then 203 applies. Otherwise, it is not. It is just because you appointed the CS, it is not been voluntarily you know to appoint the other position. Also, it is up to you. But voluntarily, when you appoint a particular position, then related compliance is required to be done. That is the point. Okay. Deepika, yeah. uh, Deepika, Ms. Deepika, any comment? I think uh, Bala sir very rightly put. Uh, that's what I had in mind. Uh, and, and I think Yatish's question is also the same. But if you appointed the CS, then continue with the compliances of a CS. It doesn't mean that you'll also have to appoint a CFO merely because you've appointed a CS one. Okay. So I think very rightly put by sir. So that is all I think so. I think we can actually close the session. Before uh, we close the session, I would like to compliment Aditi for doing an excellent, excellent preparation of the presentation and nicely bringing out the various concepts with the example. I would definitely, definitely like to compliment to her for the excellent PPT presented and given with the Lucid language. And Deepika's, in the beginning only, I wanted to say her 13 years career is very impressive. She seemed to have traveled from Hyderabad to Calcutta, where I see the company's name, Balrampur Chini. So that is the extent that he traveled from south to east and uh, he has also a gold medalist for three gold medalists, which is a great uh, achievement. Hats up to you, Deepika. Many thanks, sir. The, you saying this, uh, many, many thanks. It really means a lot. Kind words. Balram Puchini Mills is our investor entity, sir. I, I am based out of Mumbai. Uh, but, okay. Uh, Balram Puchini is basically from Calcutta, correct? It is from Calcutta, sir. Yeah. It's the second largest uh, sugar manufacturing. Yeah, company. I know. I know. Yes, Diti. Okay. Thank your... Thanks, uh, participants. Uh, so, again, next week's session will be there and uh, be there here. So, we have covered definition, right, Aditi? Definition uh, section is over. Uh, yes, ma'am. Definition is over. Yeah. So, thanks for the. Uh, otherwise, anyone would have thought that what is there in definition, but you connect it to various section. How that definition is important to that section, and also decided cases. Very interesting presentation. Thanks a lot, Miss Deepika. Thanks a lot for your time and inputs, and thank you very much, Miss Deepika. If you want to say any goodbye word at the end. So, uh, ma'am, all I can say is uh, it's been a pleasure here um, being a part of this uh, panel. And Aditi, I've been in touch with her for uh, a long time now. She's assisted us in a lot of projects. And her clarity of thought has really helped us every time. And today was another example. So I was not surprised at all. I knew the session is going to be as lucid and clear as it can be, which Aditi kind of showed. And uh, your presence, Bala sir's and Sudhakar's uh, sir's presence really made a lot of difference. I really enjoyed and I learned myself and uh, it was a great session with so many interesting questions coming in. Uh, we learned in the process as well, I must say. So thanks a lot to Mehta and Mehta and to everybody else. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Let's make next time. Thanks next to you time. all. Let us Thank you. Next week. See you next week. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank you, Aditi. Thanks a lot.